introduction to the book and to the, uh, the issues uh, involved in the book, why Paul wrote to Titus, um, and then we'll begin to uh, unpack those, uh, those few verses that we've just read. Um, but before we begin that, uh, let's uh, ask God for his help as we start to get to grips with what he has to say to us. Father, we thank you that your word is uh, its not merely an ancient letter, but it's a living word which by your spirit still speaks loud and clear and relevantly to us today. We pray that you might take uh, even these few verses this evening and you might, as we've already prayed, shape us to be like you. We pray that you would shape us in such a way that actually the Um, The good news of the gospel shines out in the way we live, in the things that we say. And we pray, Father, in a letter which which challenges um, a a society which is uh, in many ways corrupt, that you would help us to be honest with ourselves, that we would come to your word with humility, ready to be tested in the light of your purity. And we pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine you live in a culture where uh, truth is often fairly flexible and optional, where violence is a, a real possibility and in some cases is on the increase, where people like to party and when they do, quite often there's a real anything goes attitude to what happens, where self control is seen as repressive rather than a virtue where sexual purity is a matter for embarrassment, where news outlets can write almost anything about anyone without any real shred of evidence and without any real concern about significant consequences, where it's normal to talk about people behind their backs and normal to read the intimate details of people's uh, famous people's lives or speculation about their lives where family life is under serious threat, where the law is increasingly a matter uh, of preference for people rather than right and wrong, not not necessarily in the, the big bits like murder, but perhaps in the rather seemingly less serious bits, where drunkenness is normal where the aim is to, in life is to do um, as little work for as much money as possible, and you might go over the, uh, the boundary of the law quite easily if it, uh, if it makes the difference. Sound familiar? Maybe you don't need to imagine too hard. But that was first century Crete, uh, where Titus was currently serving at the time Paul wrote this letter to him. And just imagine that these are the sorts of things you've been used to, And then you became a Christian. Some missionaries had turned up on Crete and worked their way around the the towns and the cities, and uh, possibly even Paul himself. And and you and some others believed the gospel and started to follow Jesus. And a church starts to meet in the, the town where you're living. And you still live in your part of Crete, and you still work there, that's where your job is, and your family are still there, and you haven't joined a commune or anything like that, so your church is right there as well, in the middle of everything, and made up of people just like you. And now you begin to feel a tension. Because the way of life that Jesus commands is rather different to what you know and what you've always known, and what's going on around you right now. And you're beginning to feel sort of pulled in two directions. And, well, if you're honest, old habits die hard. So what are you going to do? How are you going to react to this tension? What is your Christian faith going to mean for your life? What is the life of your fledgling brand new church going to look like? That's the situation in the church in Crete when Paul writes to Titus. The church there was brand new. People had become Christians, and Titus had been left in Crete to finish establishing the church, to finish sort of setting up and founding it. And the church there needs solid, uh, long-term leadership. And it needs to be taught how to live. And what the gospel means for them in the midst of a corrupt culture that is very much at odds with the life that Jesus calls his people to. Verse 1. 
In fact, actually, this last need is all the more acute in Crete because not only does the gospel clash with what's seen as normal and everyday for most people, but actually already, even in a small, young church like that, people in the church are beginning to teach a brand of Christianity that melts comfortably into the values and lifestyle of Crete. And Titus' job is to get the churches in order and to teach them to live out a gospel whose values are radically different. Now, how does that fit with us? That might be a bit interesting if you're uh, interested in ancient, uh, ancient letters. But what's it got to do with us? I mean, Christ Church has been, it's not a new church. We've been here for about 100 years and the letters to Titus, you might say it's useful for uh, church leaders and uh, church planters, but what about everybody else? Well, although our situation isn't identical, our situation is not that different from ancient Crete. We live in a culture whose values and ways of life increasingly clash with the gospel. You don't have to think too hard about some of the things I opened with to see that. And it's fair to expect that this, uh, the, the church in Crete came back to this letter again and again. It wouldn't have been filed away in Titus's personal folder somewhere. You see, what Paul meant, wrote wasn't a sort of one-hit wonder. It was meant to be digested and referred to and used uh, as a diagnostic time after time after time. And I say that because it's a letter not just for Titus, but for the church as, as well. You read all the way through, it's addressed to Titus, and it's, uh, Paul speaks to Titus uh, all the way through. But in 3 verse 15, the final verse of the letter, Paul ends with the words, Grace be with you all. The idea was that though the letter is to Titus, the church is meant to be reading over his shoulder or eavesdropping as he reads it out loud. Because Titus wasn't there long term. He, he wasn't the vicar of the church in Crete. He, he was a, an apostolic delegate. He was a representative of the apostles. He was sort of Paul, if you like, because Paul himself couldn't be there. He was on special assignment. And so when the church was properly established and set up, Titus was going to move on. And then they wouldn't have Titus. But they would have the things that Paul taught them through him. This letter is not a letter primarily for leaders. It's not ultimately a leadership manual. And it doesn't belong in the pastor's section of the bookshop. It's for the church. It's to help us understand how to be God's people in the world. To teach us about living the gospel in a corrupt culture. And in these opening few verses, Paul gets us thinking straight off the bat. These, these introductory verses are short on formalities and long on focus. Paul stresses his authority and Titus's connection to him so that the churches will get why they need to listen to him, particularly when there are other teachers around teaching something a bit different. And he outlines what his ministry is all about. He says what his, his goal is, what he's aiming at. And he says, he talks about the basis of his ministry, what it's founded on. To get these churches thinking about what matters in their life as a church. To get them thinking about this, this clash between the culture and the gospel. And about the competing values and ways of life. And about what this means for their life together as a church congregation. And I've got three things for us. And the first clash to think about is gospel identity. Who are you? You may have seen the BBC TV program, Who Do You Think You Are? It's a documentary series that traces the family trees of celebrities and tries to dig up a bit of information about uh, the lives of some of their ancestors and maybe the odd juicy scandal along the way in some cases. And the title of the program really sort of hints at the, the bigger underlying question. At what sorts of things determine our identity? Where do I come from? How much of where I come from and the people I come from have affected who I am now? How much of those things are going to affect who I choose to be? 
And that's really the issue in Paul's opening statement in verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth. He's a servant of God. He's an apostle. That means he's uh, been specially sent and commissioned by Jesus. And the aim of his service, he says, the goal that he's he's he's, uh, aiming at is the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. Now this title, God's elect, isn't just a sort of Christianese that kind of rolls off Paul's pen as he writes. He's chosen it very carefully and on purpose. It's an idea that comes from the Old Testament. It's one of the ways back, uh, that, that God refers to Israel in the Old Testament. It's, uh, God's elect means his specially chosen people. People that he has specially set aside for himself. And Paul says, you who have trusted in Jesus are God's specially chosen people which is an important statement in the midst of a culture that clashes with the gospel. Are you for, first and foremost a, a Cretan or a Christian? Who do you think you are? Who's going to determine your life now? What's going to be the driving force of, of your, your life and culture in your church? Except that Paul is not asking questions, he's stating God's claim. He says, you trusted in Jesus, you belong to God. God has sewn his name tag into you, if you like. And Paul's concern is that God's people get that identity and that allegiance planted nice and deep. His concern is our faith and our knowledge of the truth. That is, that we have a vital and living trust in Jesus, a a vibrant, vigorous loyalty to, to him that comes out in the way that we live. That we are truly clear on the gospel and truly understand it. Now there's one sense in which when you become a Christian you just have those things on one level or another. But they're not static things. They're not sort of one-time events. They're, they're dynamic. They're meant to be uh, worked at and grown in coming to trust more and more in Jesus, to value him and identify with him in such a way that his rivals get smaller and smaller and smaller, coming to appreciate more and more the goodness of the gospel. There's a a Christian book published a few years ago called Gospel Deeps, And the subtitle of the book is Reveling in the Excellencies of Jesus, which says it all, really. The goodness, the the wonder of the truth of what Jesus has done and who he, he has made us goes down a really long way. And Paul's aim is to take us diving. There's nothing dry and dusty about knowledge of the truth. It's not bare intellect. We are God's elect, and Paul wants us to get to grips with that and treasure it and grow in it. Which means rejecting other claims for our identity. You see, every time our culture's values and patterns of life and priorities clash with the gospel and with the life that Jesus calls us to, there's a choice to be made. And the choice we make says something about our loyalties. It says something about who we think we are. I remember hearing a number of years ago about a church where the minister eventually had to leave because uh, one of the people in a position of responsibility in the church um, decided to move in with his girlfriend. When this was brought up as a a matter for concern at a a church leaders' meeting, the the majority of the people in the meeting argued that actually the issue didn't really need to be addressed at all because that's just what people do nowadays. And they were right. It is extremely normal. But it's not the pattern that God sets for his people. And in making that choice, those church leaders were choosing to identify with their culture rather than God's. 
Now, there are going to be all sorts of examples where we're confronted by that sort of choice. You might think about something like casual lying at work, where somebody says, well, just tell them I'm in a meeting or I'm not here, and, I'll take a, and you can take a message, I'll deal with them later. What are you going to say? How about whether and how you talk about somebody when they're not there? The question is, where do our loyalties lie? What loyalties are we cultivating? What do we want to grow in? Paul says, you are God's elect. And what matters is that you grow in your sense of, your, your sense of that and in your appreciation for it, in your faith and your knowledge of the truth. Well, strongly connected to that is the second clash that Paul raises for thought in the next bit of verse 1, which is the connection between the gospel and daily living. Gospel living. How do you recognize the true gospel? Now, on the high street where, uh, where we used to live in Nottingham a number of years ago, you'd quite often get market researchers, and they were the kind that were always worth walking extra slowly past when you were in, uh, on the high street, because they'd take you into a nearby hall and offer you food. And sometimes the research would be uh, uh, blind taste testing um, name brand products and off brand products, and so the idea was, uh, which one was the Walker's brand of crisps? Which ones were the real Smarties? Can you tell the difference? How do you recognize the real one? And that's an issue for the gospel in Crete. Uh, later in chapter 1, it becomes clear that already in that young church, there were some people who were teaching a, a corrupt, off-brand version of the gospel. And the question is, how do you recognize the real one? Which is why Paul makes that pointed statement at the end of verse 1 where he connects truth with godliness. Uh, verse 1 literally says uh, Paul is a servant and an apostle according to, i.e. for, the faith of God's elect and for the knowledge of the truth, that which is according to godliness. The idea is that there is a, an essential link between truth and godliness, that is, the gospel and godly living. Here's how you can recognize the true gospel. Godliness, the godly life that goes with it. That's your template, that's your color match card if you're a DIY sort of person. It's the life that, if the life that goes with the message is godly, then you've got the real message. And if the life that goes with the message is corrupt, then it's off-brand, it's a knockoff, it's a miserable imitation. And that can be both in the life that's lived by the people teaching and in the way of life that they advocate. And you can see it in Crete, if you move on to chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says these, uh, these teachers claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. You can tell that the gospel they teach is false because the behavior that goes with it all looks rather like the regular Cretan way of life that everybody is used to. It's ungodly. The truth, the real gospel, is in accordance with godliness. Now, that's not to say that true believers and true teachers don't sin. Paul doesn't say that. It's very hard to get that idea from his letters. Uh, the issue is more to do with the, the general pattern of somebody's life. You see, there's a great difference between a, a real believer's genuine struggle with sin and someone who acts and teaches as if sin isn't really sin at all. And yet again, this introduces a tension with our culture. There are two competing ways of life. Now, how do you tell which one is godly? What's godliness? How do you define that? Well, I think Paul simply assumes, uh, he's working on a, an assumption of the Old Testament here, that people would have already had part of, part of the scriptures that we have. We have to go on what God has told us about himself. And we find that now in the Bible. Bible. 
And we need to stay aware on that front because this problem of false gospels that blend into the culture is alive and well for us just as it was back then. It's there in plenty of churches in our denomination and others where the the heart of the gospel is said to be, for example, Jesus' radical message of love and tolerance. Now there is a profound element of truth in that and yet those things can be emphasized and taught in such a way that they lead to a way of life which fits in very nicely with the values of our society that allows us to blend in that allows us to be the same as everyone else that mutes God at any point where his commands clash with what we are used to but take it on a bit further Because it's very easy for us here to look down our noses at those churches that preach a false gospel that leads to an ungodly life. But what way of life have we committed ourselves to? And when we do hear the truth and godliness taught, how do we receive it? Because it's possible for us to be regular here, to listen well, to like a reputation for being sound and Bible-based but to switch off the moment we get to bits of godliness that we don't like or that don't suit us. To let those bits of teaching just kind of wash over us. To quietly think of reasons why that particular teaching doesn't apply to me. To have no intention of changing. What sort of gospel have you committed yourself to? What truth are you hungry for? What truth are you being taught The true gospel is in accordance with godliness. Well, the final clash that uh, Paul raises for thought is in uh, verses 2 to 4. And it's to do with hope, gospel hope. Where is your hope? Uh, We have a a two-year-old running around at home and our house is uh, suddenly full of heroes and saviors. We're particularly partial to Fireman Sam, the hero next door. Uh, who saves the day, and to Buzz Lightyear, who always comes to the rescue. They are ready to rescue you from danger and save the day. And actually, the culture that Paul writes into also had its own heroes and saviors, though on a rather bigger scale and in uh, rather more serious terms than cartoons. There were the various gods of the, the Greek and Roman pantheon, and Crete particularly was associated with Zeus. The people who lived there claimed actually that Zeus was born on Crete and died on Crete. And then there was Caesar. He was the emperor of the known world. And quite frankly, anybody who gets to that sort of level of power uh, is quite partial to the odd title or two. I understand I was looking up yesterday that Prince Charles has quite a long official title. Apparently it's His Royal Highness, Prince of Wales, KG, KT, GCB, OM, AK, QSO, PCAD, ADC, Earl of Chester, Duke of Cornwall, Duke of Rothsay, Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, and Prince and Great Steward of Scotland, if you can get that in a breath. And Caesar, in the ancient world, named himself in similar vein. In fact, actually, among others, Caesar was rather partial to the title Saviour. The gods, Caesar, they were the ones who could do something for you, who could save the day, as it were, the ones who could bring you the good life and rescue you from instability and fear and give you the life you've always dreamed of. And into that background, writes Paul, In verses 2 to 3, he outlines the basis for his ministry, why he bothers serving Jesus, why he is interested in striving for the faith of God's elect. And his basis is pretty spectacular. Verse 2, he says, The hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and at his appointed time, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me, by the command of God our Saviour. The hope of eternal life. That is rather more than the Pax Romana, the, the, the general peace brought about by the dominance of the Roman Empire. 
It's rather more than the general pagan getting by with a little help from my divine friends. It's the content of God's salvation promises from all across the Bible. It is God's grand intentions for his creation. It is a world made new. It is life as it should be. Truly blessed. Truly abundant. Truly joyful. Without death and without any of the misery and sadness and ravages and decay that go with death. The life that our best moments only echo so weakly and that our worst moments ache for. Life with true harmony between God and his people, with God at the center. Which is also rather more than the hope and the promises of our culture. You see, just like people did a couple of thousand years ago, we we also hope for a version of the good life, for prosperity, for happiness, for long life, for not too much pain and not too much sorrow or regret and a, a good sense of peace and satisfaction. But we have such a limited vision. The scope of our hopes is limited to life as we are familiar with it now. And we so often, if you're honest, have to compromise and settle and make the best of the hand we're dealt. And it's also uncertain, it's also fleeting. And to many in the world, and actually to many in our own society, it's almost entirely unreachable. But that is not so with God's eternal life. And for two reasons. The first reason is that it is promised by the God who does not lie. The gods of Greece and Rome were not known for their honesty. Uh, More than one story about Zeus involves him uh, uh, using his divine powers to deceive women into sleeping with him. The gods were prone to pettiness and moodiness and selfishness. And they weren't particularly bound by the truth. And actually, the culture on Crete echoed this. Uh, Lying on Crete was a way of life. And actually, Crete had such a reputation on this front that a term was coined, Cretanizing, which meant lying. But the God of the Bible is different. He does not lie. He doesn't do small print. He doesn't do dodgy descriptions that so twist language that his promises sound better than they actually are in reality. And he doesn't back out when it suits him and leave you high and dry. And what's more, and the second reason that God's eternal life is no pipe dream, is that his promise is already appearing. I think that's the sense of verse 3. Eternal life is already appearing being revealed in the word that God entrusted to Paul in the good news of Jesus. As the gospel is preached and lives are changed, salvation, that is eternal life, is already sort of peeking out from behind the stage curtain. Which means then that God is truly saviour. Christ Jesus is saviour in terms far grander and far more meaningful and far more secure than any Caesar, than any self-styled saviour. Now our culture might be a little bit cynical on the saviour front and the hero front unless they're of the cartoon variety. But we do set our hope in all sorts of things. In uh, political involvement and activity you think about how many people have involved themselves in the Occupy movement, for example. We put our hope one way or another in politicians. We we may not always trust and admire them, but have you ever wondered why a bunch of high-powered politicians getting together in Newport's only recently can't very simply sort out the situation in Iraq or Syria? Got the firepower, they've got the money, why aren't they sorting it out? We trust self-help. Ten tips to a stronger, better you will make your life a great deal better. 
We trust in comfort. We trust in career. We trust in preparedness and organization of our lives. We trust in family for satisfaction. We trust and hope in these things to bring us peace and in one form or another, the good life, the satisfying life. And while they can, in many ways, do us a great deal of good, they're fragile. They're frail. They're prone to failure. They are prone to prove false. So the question is, what and who will really change your life? What and who will really satisfy you and really last? Because this is another area where the gospel and our culture come crashing up against each other. Where is your hope? Where, who is your saviour? In Christ, God calls us to a new identity, to a new way of life, to a true hope and to a true saviour. Have you noticed the clashes with our culture? And are you living and embracing the grace of God in our world? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the great salvation that has appeared with the good news of Christ. We thank you that you are a true saviour that you bring uh, not just the good life, but eternal life. We pray that you would help us as your people to put our faith firmly in you, to find our identity in you, to find our life in you and our hope in you. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to choose those things above uh, all other identities, all other ways of life, all other hopes. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.